seeds from a bunch of places. So thank you for joining us. And you might, if you want to say a few words of introduction about yourself, a few more things, it might be just so that people know where you're coming from. Sure. And then you'll uh, leave you to your talk. Okay. And we will try and finish by about four, so that we can have your presentations. Could you just load all the stuff onto onto my computer? That'd be great. Is there a different lighting? We'll turn this, yeah, sorry, there is. Uh, just turn that off. Oh, yeah, that's is good. Is that better? Yeah, that's much better. I think that's what we know. Yeah. Yeah. A little light. Is that's that perfect. Lighting? That's good. great. I think that's what we <coughs> Okay, hi. My name is Robert Cowherd, uh, and I um, something happened to me when I finished architecture school. Um, I was minding my own business, uh, working away at my internship uh, in New York and San Francisco when uh, an economic recession uh, took out a lot of the work of architecture offices. And fortunately at the time, I was nurturing uh, research interests in um, first in Italy, uh, learned Italian, was all set to go study the way culture, the interplay between culture and urban space and form. So I was very interested in urban design issues and the operation of culture through urban, uh, the urban context. Uh, and so I was all set to go to Italy uh, when my attention was drawn to uh, the island of Java. Uh, and the internet was coming out then, so I did a search my first search ever on the internet uh, was Java. And I, I got 40,000 hits, which at that time, it's hard to imagine anything more than that. But I was very disappointed to find out that it was all the, the scripting language. Um, and very, very few of those had to do with Java the island, and very few of, even fewer of those had anything to do with Java in relationship to architecture. So I decided, you know, there have been a lot of people going back and forth to Italy to look at architecture, and hardly <coughs> anyone to Java. Uh, it turns out that uh, very few people have gone to Java and looked at architecture, except for during the colonial period, um, some Dutch architects, because it was a Dutch colony. And uh, then there was a man by the name of Hassan Udin Khan who uh, lived in Java and looked at architecture. Um, and I didn't know him at the time, but uh, we met later. Um, so um, it turns out that the history of architecture of the 20th century in Java uh, does a lot of the work that uh, those of us who are interested in the material related to this course, uh, it does a very good job of demonstrating the operation of architecture to do other things beyond architecture. Things like establishing an identity for a society or a newly independent country. Uh, things like uh, promoting international trade networks, uh, promoting the image of places uh, abroad. Um, these are all familiar concepts to you because it's been the, the agendas that are driving this course. Um, those agendas operate in architecture uh, throughout history and today in places like Roger Williams University, there's a lot of image construction through architecture. But somehow we take it for granted when it's happening around us and uh, we almost don't, it's almost invisible to us until we look at it in some place far away or a long time ago. So um, that's kind of the framework of why this is interesting material to us today is because it's a vivid demonstration of what architecture can do beyond simply uh, the normal operations of architecture and how does architecture do what it does. And so uh, this lecture starts out, it, I, there was a reading. Did, did someone, did anyone read the reading? 
on bridges that you put on? Uh, so um, anticipating that it wouldn't be universally uh, ingested uh, and capture your full attention, um, I'm, I'll, I'll cover a little bit of what's in the reading. Um, but there's much more in the reading that I'm not going to have time to cover here. Um, so uh, it, it takes us uh, back to the night of September 28th. It was a Friday night in 1923 in the uh, Dutch colonial city of Bandung, Java. And at that time, uh, Indonesia was not yet a country. Uh, it was a colony of the Netherlands. It was called the Dutch East Indies. And uh, two decades earlier, <clears throat> the Queen of the Netherlands declared that no longer would the Dutch colonial uh, program simply exploit uh, the, the people of Java and the other islands of Indonesia uh, and take as much as they can out of it. They would keep taking as much as they can out of it, but they wouldn't just take stuff out. They would also set up schools. They would also set up um, institutions to uh, empower or at least reduce the burdens of colonial rule to give some dignity back to the people of the Dutch East Indies and to try to justify the continued existence of the Dutch colonial system into the 20th century, into modern times, despite the fact that everyone back in the Netherlands saw this as a bar barbaric, barbaric uh, set of practices of oppression of uh, the peoples of the archipelago of Southeast Asia. So they were under a lot of pressure and the queen uh, made a speech and she said, the old colonial oppression is over. Uh, the new period uh, that she announced was called the ethical policy period. And so she announced the ethical policy of the Dutch government to build civic institutions in the colonies uh, and help restore the dignity and the well-being of the people who had been colonized and oppressed for so long. And she did this in large part in response to uh, a, a book, a novel that went viral in the late 19th century that we've never heard of, but uh, Dutch school children still study this novel to the present. It was called Max Havelar, or the, uh, the Coffee Auctions of Sumatra. And they, uh, it was a story of how the colonial system of sucking commodities out of the archipelago caused widespread um, misery, including, uh, by some estimates, hundreds of thousands or more deaths by starvation because they were not growing rice, they were growing coffee, tea, quinine, uh, all the products that were required by the Dutch colonial system to keep operating. So this, this is the whole history uh, of this new period. And the challenge of the new period was for the Dutch colonial administration to make a very convincing case that, okay, everything's gonna change now um, you're not going to fight a war for independence. You're going to be happy citizens of the Netherlands. We welcome you as the Southern Netherlands. And uh, I've met many people who report that in their classrooms growing up, you know, older people, in their classrooms in school, they would have a, a map of the Northern Netherlands, which we know as the Netherlands, and the southern Netherlands, which we know as Indonesia. And they were both, these two maps uh, were of the greater Netherlands, the, the nation state of the Netherlands. Uh, and that was embedded in their awareness and their psychology. And there are still some older Dutch people who still are broken hearted that they lost their southern Netherlands back in uh, 1949.
when independence was declared at the end of World War II. So back to Bandung uh, in the Friday night in 1923, where there was a debate on the stage uh, of this building uh, between two architects. And it was uh, a gathering to debate what is the appropriate architecture for the new uh, Dutch East Indies ethical policy period. And this sounds very strange to us today uh, because we don't think of architecture as performing that function for us. We don't, we don't have meetings about, okay, uh, there's a new president in the White House. What's going to be the official architecture of the Trump administration? We don't do that. The closest we come is the, uh, the Clinton li presidential library or the Reagan presidential library or the Bush presidential library, Obama, et cetera. That's the one time we get to say, this is an architecture that establishes and personifies uh, the image and the meaning of this political arrangement. Um, but back then, it was just taken for granted that at the cutting edge of establishing the legitimacy of the ongoing Dutch colonial project, architecture was going to take on the task of establishing the terms uh, by which that arrangement would continue. It would be so what, is, what do you have to do if you're going to continue the colonial arrangement? You have to give dignity to the, uh, the colonial <laughs> subjects, and you have to um, demonstrate the capacity of the Dutch colonial administration to elevate and civilize the colonial subjects. So it's, 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 it's a little difficult to do both you know, give people dignity and then say, we're going to, we know you have dignity, here you go, here's your dignity, uh, architecture is doing this, and we're going to elevate you because you're part of the Netherlands. Um, it's a t tough job to do, and, and in the end, um, didn't work. Indonesia is not part of the Netherlands anymore. So these two architects were up on stage, and um, the first architect was named Wolf Schumacher. Both architects were ethnically Dutch, but born on the island <coughs> of Java. Uh, both uh, lived out their lives. They were born and raised and died on the island of Java. Um, but they both went to architecture school in Delft in the Netherlands. So uh, a lot of architects would go to architectural school in Europe and then come back home to the Dutch East Indies and perform colonial service. The architecture was a, a big part of the colonial service. So Wolf Schumacher started the debate and he said, like everyone before me, I am uh, clear about the fact that there's only one kind of architecture found in the Dutch East Indies that has any value at all. It's the stone monuments left by the Indian uh, colonial operation. India never colonized Java or the rest of the islands, but at the time, the archaeological evidence suggested that India did colonize because all the great stone monuments were all very much transplanted directly from India. It turns out that what we now know is that uh, it wasn't India colonizing Java. It was just Java going crazy over Indian culture. The Indian culture just went viral. The religion, uh, the rice agricultural system, uh, the, all the arts, uh, the language, uh, Javanese, everything. Um, and so that's uh, a very interesting uh, thing to study in and of itself. Um, but Schumacher said, it's all about Indian monuments as the great civilizing force in the Dutch East Indies. And anything else was made out of wood. And uh, wood was meant to be used 
and then to age and rot away and disappear back into the jungle. And anything made out of wood was worthless. Anything made out of stone was the great legacy of, of the great civilization of India. And he even brought into it the uh, phrenology, uh, which was the pseudoscience of studying the shape of human skulls. And at the time, it was a very popular way to classify humans as either being civilized <coughs> or um, primitive, of either being uh, noble people or criminals. Uh, and so it was a racial uh, classification science, pseudoscience, where you could tell by the shape of people's skull uh, the kind of character they had, and Schumacher used that as a direct application. He would say, Borobudur, the great Buddhist stupa, the largest Buddhist uh, stupa in the world, uh, you can tell it's, a, it's the product of great civilization and that it is great architecture because of the nobility of its profiles. Um, using racial language. And Prambanan, uh, a few, uh, few dozen kilometers away, um, the Hindu temple, again, you can tell that it's the product of great civilization because of the nobility of its form. And um, he went on to, in those same few years, to look uh, very much to Frank Lloyd Wright, to Frank Lloyd Wright's example. Um, Frank Lloyd Wright was also uh, going viral at the time in uh, Europe, and then by extension in lots of other parts of the world, including Asia. And so uh, Schumacher said, just as the great ar American architect Frank Lloyd Wright has done with the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo, uh, which was built the same year as this debate. Uh, he said, uh, here's what you do. You create a modern structure, and you use that modern structure as the armature for elaborations that reflect the great uh, achievements of civilization. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright liked to use uh, Maya uh, <coughs> forms uh, in a lot of his work. And um, here's a tower of Frank Lloyd Wright's Imperial Hotel. And here's uh, the hotel that Wolf Schumacher uh, designed for Bandung uh, in the years around the same time as the debates. And I don't have a picture of the tower. But, um, but you can see that it's uh, very much um, an emulation of the approach taken by Frank Lloyd Wright with the Imperial Hotel that you create a modern building of concrete uh, using these, this modern vocabulary of architectural form. And then you ennoble that structure by embellishing it with, uh, and you can choose from a menu of possible great civilizations to emulate. And here, Wolf Schumacher uses the Mayan. Because what else are you going to do? Uh, you could use Indian or uh, a few other, handful of other forms, but uh, he chose to follow in Frank Lloyd Wright's footsteps. So that was the first presentation uh, by Wolf Schumacher on the left. And on the right, we have Henri McLean de Pont's um, rebuttal. Pont was also deeply inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright's work, uh, the Arts and Crafts. But he was also, he was married to a Javanese woman. He was a, a big lover of Javanese performing arts, the Gamelan Orchestra. Does anyone know what Gamelan is? Gamelan. And the Shadow Puppet Theater of uh, Java, Bali, elsewhere. No Shadow Puppet Theater. Um, Actually, in the first lecture, we had a couple of slides, but that's a long time ago. When I also showed you Borobudo, do you remember Borobudo? Which you just saw? Anyway. They don't remember. They don't remember. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long time ago. It was. It was. The beginning of the semester. So um, Pont was a lover of all things Javanese, and he knew that what Schumacher was saying, he knew in his gut that what Schumacher was saying was not just wrong. 
it was evil and it needed to be pushed back upon and you can't, uh, and not only that, the debate they were there to settle, what's the appropriate architecture of the ethical policy of the, of the modern Dutch colonial uh, state? You can't do it by celebrating Mayan culture. That's just not going to work. And so he says, there's plenty of great civilizations right here in the islands of the Dutch East Indies. And so um, he married, uh, he took a survey of all the roof forms and architectural expression of all the wood structures that Schumacher thought deserved to be uh, rotting in the jungle. And he said, no, these are great cultural achievements. They all have great deep meanings and a long history, a long dignified history. And they deserve to be highlighted and elevated uh, as we move forward into the 20th century of Dutch colonial uh, world. And he also brought this arts and crafts technology of these wooden trusses, uh, the great um, engineering achievements of timber and uh, steel brackets, steel connectors. That, and that's the technology he used inside the Bandung Institute of Technology. And it's interesting, Brian was just showing me uh, an image of another build, a newer building at the Bandung Institute of Technology that is um, actually a direct uh, emulation of this original building from 1923. So um, um, these things are still in circulation somehow. And so this might be one of the key images of this lecture. That at the time when he was attempting to articulate the appropriate architectural approach for uh, a Dutch colonial architecture that would give dignity to uh, the Javanese people and the Sumatran, Mina Kabao. There's really, you, you couldn't, at this time in history, you couldn't really say Indonesian because it wasn't a thing yet. And even now, Indonesia is barely a thing. It is a nation state, but it really is. Uh, there's 16,000 islands, more than 16,000 islands. Uh, and there are at least 400 distinct cultural identities that are all piled together in this one nation of Indonesia. It's as if um, the Europeans didn't kill off all the peoples of, uh, of North America when they came, and we now had 400 nations of Native Americans living with all the immigrants that came after uh, the discovery the rediscovery of the Americas. So it's like that, except no one killed off all the original inhabitants of these islands. And so the Javanese, the Sumatra, the Minangkabau, the Achenese, um, the Balinese, uh, the Sumbanese, the Sumbawanese, there are 400 and, or more. So uh, Pont uh, looked at all these cultures. He kind of did a he, he did a creative hybridization of a lot of the different roof forms, and then he supported it with a pretty straightforward, rigid, very rigid uh, European approach to engineering the roof of the building. And so, despite the fact that you have these swoopy forms at the bottom image, you see that the swoop is almost like a Disney approach. The swoop is not something that is the product of a structural uh, deflection. The swoop is created by uh, these sticks that um, that rough it out and then the last gesture completes the swoop. Um, so that's the key thing and that was the thing that Pont uh, left the stage that night feeling like he hadn't done a good enough job. Um, and you see, you know, this is there is a precedent within the vernacular architecture uh, where you create this swoopy form by building it up from below. And you'll notice that some of this is wood, um, <coughs> squared off lumber. Some of it is still uh, uh, tree trunks that are 
are round, and some of this is bamboo. So that'll come up later. So Pont uh, basically lost the debate. Schumacher walked off the stage having won the argument uh, uh, because Pont really didn't have a strong enough response. And the building he was working on here itself was not convincing enough. And uh, Pont himself was, or took, it, took it hard, uh, judging by what he did next. Um, you may have heard of Henri uh, uh, Berlage, or Berlage. I think we, he was the famous Dutch architect uh, of modernism uh, around 1900. Um, and he was a very important person globally. He was the superstar architect of the Netherlands. Uh, and he was one of the people who uh, built on top of the legacy of Frank Lloyd Wright and established what is still called the Amsterdam School of Architecture, uh, using a lot of brick and very expressive forms. Have you heard of the Amsterdam School? Have you, have you been to Amsterdam? Mm -hmm. So you may have seen the Amsterdam School architect. You probably went to the Burst van Berlacha, the the, stock, the old stock exchange building by Berlacha, right in the Amsterdam Harbor, along the Damrock, right by Central Station. Mm -hmm. yeah, I see it, maybe. <laughs> I don't have it, sorry. It has trusses with tie rods in it, because the structure was like, pushing out too much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it had a big open hall in the center. Yeah, yeah lots of tie rods. Anyway, Berlacha. And so he came <laughs> to the Dutch East Indies. Um, and he was blown away by all this wooden tradition of architecture. And he very much came down on the side of Pont, not Schumacher, not Schumacher. And a lot of things were happening at the time, but I'm going to skip over some of these. Um, so here's the Minyan Kabao of central Sumatra. Now here, if you it's not hard to imagine what's happening underneath this roof. It's not a segmented uh, structure. The ridge beams here are actually deflecting under the load of the roof. So Schumacher was saying, I'll prove to you that uh, Javanese uh, building, wooden buildings, uh, they have no idea what they're doing. And he showed uh, the orientation of the, the, the roof rafter. They're re rectangular roof rafters. Does anyone have like a, well, a rectangular roof rafter? And any self-respecting person who understands how structures work, uh, which way would you orient your roof rafter? This way or this way? Who says this way? Who says this way? Yeah. OK. Why? Why would you orient it this way and not this way? Deflection, right? This is, look at that. Thank you for putting this here. It's perfect. And now let's try this way. Oh, oh, so hard. Here. Try it in both ways. Which way does it bend easier? Yeah, OK. So she's verifying my point. Schumacher said, not only are these wood buildings worthless, I can prove it, they don't even know how to orient their roof rafters. Their roofs are all droopy. So are you saying the, the ridge in, in the, those roofs are like plank orientation, and that's why they're so deflected? Well, if, it, if it's oriented this way and it's deflected like that, they'd, they'd have to curve cut it or something, right? Have you guys built things? Yeah. It looks to me like if I, if I were Schumacher, I'd say, look, they don't even know how to do stuff. Right? Look how bent. It got all bent. Right? So that was basically Schumacher's point with Javanese structure. He's saying, look, their roofs are sagging. Clearly, these people have very low character. They have a very low self-esteem. Look at those saggy roof structures. Right? Why can't they be... You know, if they were dignified people of high quality character, their roof rafters would not sag, right? So that was his point. 
and Pont uh, was like, had, had no ready response. But he started looking around, and this is one of the bits of evidence that he found. Um, both Pont and, um, well, not Pont, well, not, Car not Schumacher, but um, several architects, when they come back from Delft and end up in the Dutch East Indies, they send them out to all the islands and they tell them, listen, your job is to go from village to village and town to town and educate people to not build uh, wrong. And what's wrong? Well, first of all, no more longhouses. We are a Christian colonial power. We can't have these people cohabitating with lots of families in a single longhouse. That is sinful. To have married couples living, multiple married couples living under one roof, we cannot allow that. Second, thatch roofs. Thatch roofs are the devil's playground as well, but this time what we mean by that is rats and bugs and mold and rot. No more thatch roofs, only ceramic clay tile roofs. And third, stop building with bamboo. Bamboo uh, decays too quickly. Um, and again, we need healthy, hygienic buildings for our colonial subjects. So build out of wood, not bamboo, clay tile roofs, not thatch, and single family dwellings, not longhouses. Go. And so that was Pont's job. He went, he went around to the 400 different uh, uh, cultural groups, and he, this was the message he was charged with delivering. But while he was doing it, he also has this anthropological turn of mind. He learned so much about all their building traditions. And he learned so much about uh, the meaning and the techniques and, the, and why they were building with bamboo. And so he and his buddy, his buddy was Karsten, they figured out how to uh, soak bamboo in salt water for a week uh, or more and then take it out and let it dry. And that makes it very unappetizing for both fungus and uh, insects. So they developed a method. They started with salt water, but then they uh, moved on to boric acid. And so they developed technologies for preserving bamboo, even as their official task was to banish the construction of anything out of bamboo. So I'm planting the seed for later. Just remember, bamboo was bad, and it was outlawed, but Pont helped uh, uh, invent the way to preserve bamboo. So how many of you have looked at the work of Kenneth Frampton? He's been mentioned in this course uh, at least once, I think more than once in the syllabus. Mainly in um, thesis prep we did. OK, so you read Frampton. Yeah, he had a piece from this there, plus his critical regions. So the critical regionalism and the tectonic culture uh, work of Kenneth Frampton um, very much plays into and informs this view of history. Um, Pont basically came back from his tour of banishing uh, bamboo, and he was haunted by uh, this debate. And um, so he went back to Borobudur, remember the stone Buddhist stupa, and he looked at the artwork of uh, the scenes depicted on the, the walls of Borobudur. And he sees throughout these sculptural stories of the life of Buddha, but depicted as if it were happening in Java. He sees all of these buildings that are clearly wooden structures or bamboo structures. And sometimes they have straight roofs. Sometimes they have swoopy roofs. And um, he looked at how bamboo techniques of joinery were related to the later methods of wooden. So there were always bamboo methods and then equivalent timber frame methods. As the Dutch colonial program of eliminating bamboo construction uh, advanced, one of the things that happened is the social function of bamboo architecture was devastated. 
when uh, before uh, the colonial campaign against bamboo, when the village needed a new uh, temple or mosque or, or a, a gathering hall, um, the head of the village would say to each family, okay, you provide uh, those four columns. And this family, you provide 23 roof rafters. And this family, you provide the thatch. And so every family would be designated a piece of the structure to contribute and then place on the building because everyone grows up knowing how to work with bamboo. Everyone knows how to work with thatch because that's how <clears throat> everything gets built. Is Nothing gets built unless everybody is helping because it's so much work. Um, and there's one master builder in the village who is also a priest because uh, not only is bamboo uh, an important building material, but everything that is important as a building material, everything that's important as a crop, basically everything has a religious, spiritual meaning to it. And so you can't just build stuff. You have to ask the priest of the village, uh, what should we build? How should we build it? What day should we start to please the gods? What sacrifices should we make? What offerings should we make when we finish the roof? Uh, what's the first day that we can uh, officially inaugurate and occupy the building? All of these things are dictated by the spiritual uh, definitions and readings. And so it's all very much integrated together. The spiritual religious life is integrated with the architectural and construction practices. So what happens when you get rid of the bamboo uh, exchange economy? and social arrangements around the shared production of buildings, wood structures require much more sophisticated tools, knowledge, skills, uh, training, uh, and it's much more demanding, which makes it a lot more expensive. So all of a sudden, the same buildings might last longer, but they're so much more expensive to produce, and it's no longer an exercise in spiritual bonding. You know, previously, uh, when you're building a building, it's a way to unify the people of the village and a way for each villager to demonstrate their commitment to the social welfare of the whole society of the village. So it played a very significant social function. But all that was lost with the banishment of bamboo. Um, so another thing that uh, Pont noticed <clears throat> and he ended up, um, as part of his study going throughout the archipelago, uh, looking at all these different buildings. And he said, he finally had the answer about these swoopy roofs, that these roofs are meant to, to deflect. That's not, a, that's not a, a, a defect, that's a feature. That's... Uh, something we like to say around our condominium complex whenever there's something that's broken we say that's not a defect that's a feature well in this case uh, he makes a very strong case that um, these roof types are really emulating a tensile structure such as a tent and so he demonstrates in these cross-sectional analytical drawings with these dotted lines a very slight curvature on each of these roofs, uh, demonstrating that it's on purpose. Uh, and each one of these has a, a curved deflection. Um, so you, does everybody see that deflection? So he's saying it's a good thing. It's actually one of the sophistication, <coughs> the more sophisticated aspects of Javanese uh, uh, our architecture. Now, I think I discovered this analysis um, when I was around the time I was taking your class at MIT, um, because I was starting to, I, I, I started this story by saying uh, the recession happened. I was interested in research uh, of Javanese urban space in relationship to culture. I was awarded a three-month grant to go 
to Java and study the architecture of this one city of Solo. And I ended up staying for four years. And during those four years, I ended up working uh, with the king of Java. There, yes, there was a king, and he had 36 children by six wives. And um, we did a lot of interesting things. Uh, and one of the things we did is we did a very careful analysis of the Bang Sal Witono in Solo, that building on the right. And um, I had already done this work for four years. I was done with that work. And then I came to Boston to take a class with your instructor at MIT. And um, it was only after I had left Solo that I found these drawings and said, oh, look, it's, um, it's the building that I worked on. And so here I am working on that building. Um, we did an analytical set of analytical drawings. And see those roof rafters? All uh, This is called the sleeping orientation. This is the standing orientation. And this is the sleeping orientation of the rafter. So all those sleeping rafters, uh, you can't see the deflection, but they are deflecting a bit. And um, there were also, it's a very strange thing, where the top of those rafters are not being supported by the columns and beams uh, off to the left of the image. It's very strange. Why would they do that? Well, the reason they do that, uh, I think, is clear in this diagram. You can see here that the lower roof is hanging off of the tail, the rafter tails of the upper roof, which are uh, kind of in a seesaw relationship to these structural beams, which create a fulcrum. And so as this roof droops and hangs here, and the weight of the lower roof hangs on the rafter tails, this pulls downward which uh, crosses the fulcrum point at that corner and uh, takes some of the droop out of that upper roof. So as this load increases, the deflection disappears as this load, like in an earthquake or in a, in a wind, uh, you can picture what will happen is this roof is behaving like this mechanical mechanism that, that moves. Uh, and Pont's discovery of this, his analysis of this, uh, and is confirmed by the later um, colonial era analytical drawings of these hanging roof uh, mechanisms where the lower roof hangs over off the tail ends of the upper roof. Um, it confirms this very interesting and complex uh, arrangement and um, so Pont publishes this article and, and claims, this is not a defect. This is an extremely sophisticated, not only are they not unsophisticated, they don't do this uh, drooping rafter by mistake. This is the whole point. The drooping, ra drooping rafter is the whole point. It has religious significance, as does everything uh, in the building traditions. Um, this is the uh, priest, builder, architect, Pa'asmo, who I worked with in the palace uh, in the city of Solo, uh, restoring one of the sacred buildings. And he's wearing a ribbon that signifies to the Queen of the South Seas, the mystical goddess who oversees the kingdom. Um, this is a signal to her that he is a friend of the king's. Don't harm him. He's in the palace, and he's a friend of the king's. And here he is in his priest, priestly garb, um, carpenter by day, priest by night. Uh, he's one of the most important people in the palace because the palace itself, and this is the other lecture I come to Roger Williams to give sometimes, the palace itself is a giant instrument for uh, correcting and maintaining the balance of power between the heavens and the earth. All good fortune that flows from heaven to earth comes through the center of the palace. Sometimes things happen to obstruct that flow of goodness from heaven, and it's his job to say, 
perform a ceremony there, give an offering there, fix this building, tear down that building to remove the obstruction of that flow of power from heaven to earth, to keep everything running smoothly, to make sure there are no earthquakes or famines or rebellions in the kingdom. And every building uh, uses units of measure that are based on the size of the owner's body, right down to the, the size of the owner's hands. And every piece of every building has a name that simultaneously signifies uh, its technical function as a piece of the structure, but also refers to these mystical uh, spiritual functions of each piece. So everything is not just a metaphor, but is an instrument for uh, restoring uh, the balance of heaven and earth. And thus it is that uh, when Islam, this is a quick side trip to look at um, Islamic form, Islamic architecture of Southeast Asia. Uh, when Islam spread from the Middle East, it was uh, a very cosmopolitan force in that it took the otherwise warring tribes of Arabia, and you'll correct me if I get this too uh, cartoonish, um, and they unified them all. They, they unified uh, all these previously divisive uh, identities, and they all became the believers, the people of the book, the uh, Muslims. They became Muslims. And uh, it, as it moved into Africa, it embraced uh, the use of local building traditions as the mosque architecture, and thus you get the, the great mosque architecture of uh, North Africa, Timbuktu, famously those mud buildings. Similarly, when it came to Southeast Asia, they said, uh, basically, we need a mosque form. It needs to be something important. Um, and at the time, um, Hinduism, Hindu Balinese, uh, Hindu, Hindu Buddhist religion was the dominant uh, belief system throughout the archipelago. And the most important architecture of the Hindu Buddhist system were these odd numbered uh, square plan roof, tiered, tiered roof structures. And so Islam came and they said, um, we, will, we will adopt and adapt this tradition. We will also have a square plan. So the Southeast Asian mosque has a square plan with three tiers of roof. With, uh, it, there are variations that uh, throughout the entire region between uh, Vietnam and um, uh, Papua New Guinea. Uh, so there's multiple different uh, versions of basically the same formulation which was first uh, consummated and comprehensively uh, established in the mosque of Damak, Java. So three tiers of roofs with four primary pillars that stand for the four pillars of Islam as practiced um, in the region. And this is uh, the version that uh, was the mosque uh, at the palace where I was working for four years. And so it's an interesting demonstration of a similar thing that's going on. Uh, the, the Dutch were saying, what is the architecture of the Dutch uh, colonial administration? And Islam said, what is the architecture of Islam in Java? And it worked so well that it was embraced uh, throughout Southeast Asia. Am I getting this? You're the, you're good? Yeah, yeah sure. You'll tell me later? Yeah. Right. Question. Was there a reason why they were the odd numbers of the rooms? Because isn't that something that also is in, like, is, is it always odd, like three or five or seven? Or yes. Is it always, is there a reason? Well, in Hindu Buddhist, it's always odd. Mm -hmm. And the more roofs, the more sacred. Because yeah. isn't that like Japanese roofs as well? Like no. I don't know. That's a great question. <laughs> um, but for Islam, it's three, okay. unless it's four. But always three, except four. 
Um, there, as I said, there are variations. You will find other numbers, but the vast majority of them are three. Also in Buddhism and Hinduism, eight is another number, the square, four to eight. So there are, there's all these numbers yeah, in, the in different plan cultures. Sure. Sorry? Uh, I, I said I remember the square plan before, but yeah. I wasn't sure. <coughs> the, four, the four columns, right? You guys looked at some of those in the buildings that you presented. There are five things. <laughs> but not right. in, not in Java. The other which thing, I don't know. Which one is missing? <laughs> I thought they were all there. But, uh, because the fifth one was the invisible pillar that was in the center. Which was, which Thank was you. on the top of the roof. So there was... Okay, so still five. The they are still five. They are so the tricky. And the, four came, <laughs> and the four also came from more traditional buildings from the past. So pre-Islamic. The, the master of the... The Soko Guru, yeah, the master teacher pillars. And the other important thing is the, the roofs come to a point. The four roof planes come to a singular point, which is very rare in uh, Javanese and Balinese traditions. It's always a ridge. And so only the most important special buildings uh, is where they come to a point. So Islam did sort of play with the local, they use the local, but for mosques it got a little slightly different form. The mark is the first of them, but there's a bunch of others too. Yeah. There's a whole lot of them. And so, um, <coughs> the interesting thing with Pont is he goes on to do these, a series of experimental structures where uh, he, he exaggerates the droop. So look at these roofs, and look at him exaggerating the bending aspects. And he's not doing this with wood timber. He's not doing this with bamboo. He's doing this with cables. And I'm not, I don't... Somewhere in my collection I have a picture of the roof from below. And you see uh, every ceramic uh, tile roof has a tab on the bottom and usually that hooks have you ever has anyone ever worked on a clay tile roof so that you just hook it on the there's, so there's a wooden a very small wooden piece that crosses the roof and you take one tile after another and you just hook it on there they're just laid on there there's no nails this is hooked on there just pop 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 well instead of hooking them onto a wooden uh, support, they're hooked onto a cable. And so he created these very dramatic, uh, complex curvature roofs that flex uh, in lateral loading conditions of wind and uh, earthquakes. Um, and here's um, an older picture of um, his tensile roofs. And so, um, so let's push pause there. Are there any questions about any of this? We're about to move into the last bit, which you might find um, more stimulating. Yeah. Um, I was going to ask, you were talking about how like, um, some of the local traditions is like, like the master priest, builder, architect, like where is the thing for like the, um, the, the goddess of the South Sea? Well, we all wear that. Oh, you all did? Yeah. Um, is there still like a like a decent like percentage of people living in Java who would like still practice like their like traditional religion? Well, it's like, really like, more rural areas. It's really interesting. Uh, even in the palace, when I first made friends with one of the princes there, um, he was very eager to tell me what I needed to hear, and so he was saying, "Nah, nah, all this stuff is gone." we're going to turn the palace into a shopping mall. Um, and so he thought, you know, I'm from the U.S., that's what people from the U.S. do, and that's what we like. We love shopping malls and skyscrapers and guns and fast cars. Everyone knows that who's paying attention to movies coming out of the U.S. So his first version of the story of the palace was very stripped away. Globalization is, 
you know, almost done. We just have 3% left to finish the job. But then as I got to know him, he figured out that that's, I was not Sylvester Stallone's younger brother and skinnier <laughs> brother. I was uh, actually interested in stuff, and I was curious, and he started opening up. And it turns out that his father, the king, was both this kind of lazy playboy character who hangs out at the hotel bar, but he's also the most important religious figure. He's like the Dalai Lama of Javanese Hindu Buddhism, and he's like the, the central figure of Islam uh, in central Java. So he started helping me understand that all these practices, the reason that the king had no money is that whatever money they had, it went to continue the religious ceremonies, the offerings, the um, practices that were so important for maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. So he would tell me one story uh, when I first got there, but as I stayed longer and longer, he shared with me uh, a deeper portrayal uh, that both were true. There was a lot of globalization going on. There was a threat to turn the, the palace into a tourist attraction, you know, a, a theme park, uh, et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, there, was also, there were also tens of thousands of people on religious holidays who would walk in from the village. Sometimes they'd walk for two days to come into the palace, participate in a religious ceremony, and, and uh, it, because it was important to their survival, their crops uh, thriving, their children's health. It was a very important thing for them religiously. And so that was also still going on. So it is also still going on. And maybe I'll point out in the next part kind of the dual nature. You know, globalization, yes, it's a thing. Um, but is it uh, erasing forever and for all time these uh, more uh, uh, spiritual practices? Not necessarily. Maybe, but it's not a slam dunk. There's evidence to suggest that it's not going anywhere. Is that? Other questions? So what religion is the king? Then? What religion is the king? Well, what answer would you like me to say? If you're a Muslim, <laughs> I'll say, oh, he is the head of the Islamic religion for well, all of Java. If he's head of, like, say, three, four, however many religions, does he have a religion? Or is he part of all of religions? See, or? this is a beautiful question. <laughs> So I, as a researcher in this palace, I would interview lots of people and I'd say, okay, I talked to this guy and he explained that this octagonal column was uh, all about the Hindu uh, sequence of birth, life, death. You know, uh, it's, it's a Hindu, obviously, eight, Hindu, eight. And then I talked to another guy and he said, Oh no, uh, the prophet lived uh, to be the age of 64, and uh, that's eight groups of eight. So eight, you know, it's a, it's a Muslim. It's, this column is all about the Muslim religion. And um, I talked to another guy, and he'd say, no, no, it's not Hindu or Muslim. It has to do with the Queen of the South Seas, which is not, she's not Hindu, and she's not Muslim. She's this mythical animist being who lives under the ocean. Uh, and it's all about her, right? And so I would go to my friend who uh, was my primary informant, and I would say, which is it? You gotta tell me, who's lying and who's telling the truth? And he would say, no one's lying. They're all telling the truth. Why do you have to strip it away to having one right answer and the others are wrong? So does the king just not identify with any particular religion? Why? Do you insist? I'm 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 speaking for him now. Why do, he would say? Why do you insist that if uh, he can't choose one over all others, he has no religion? Why can't you simply allow him to be uh, an important figure in each of these three religious practices? He identifies with all of them. At the at the um, anniversary of his coronation, he reinforces uh, several things that are Islamic in nature. 
And then he goes up into the tower where he has sex with uh, the Queen of the South Seas um, in the top of the tower. Do you have a problem with that? I think some people do have a problem with that. A lot of people have a problem with that. But within the tradition of Javanese uh, cultural practices, this is all together a syncretic formation of the Javanese religion. It has, it, the Javanese religion is Islam, is Hindu Buddhist, is uh, the Queen of the South Seas. So he's just, is the king just for that religion then? Or is he like the Well, the Javanese are the dominant cultural group mm -hmm. of Indonesia. So they, um, they're, they're the largest population demographically. They control the military. Until recently, they controlled the government. Uh, so they're the dominant cultural force. So they are one of the 400, but they are number one of 400. Yeah. So that covers more than just the island of Java. Yes. And some would say um, the Javanese, since independence, controlled, they basically, the Dutch left and the Javanese said, uh, just leave the keys on the desk, we'll take it from here. And they colonized, they continued the role as colonizer uh, in the sense that they were the dominant economic force along with the ethnic Chinese um, of Jakarta and Surabaya. So from this uh, quick survey of the multiplicity of roof forms, and by the way, if someone explains to you that, of course, the architecture looks this way, it's the climate, right? Take that with a grain of salt. If you look at the variety and diversity of architectural expression and form, uh, all with more or less the same climate, suddenly climate in and of itself does not work as uh, the one and only explanation for why architecture looks the way it looks. I'm tempted to say that it was a form of cultural competition. My architecture is more distinctive than your architecture. Uh, it was an instrument of identity assertion, both outwardly to others who uh, would you want to be known by, and also inwardly so that there's a cohesive, unified identity of uh, your own society. And so it's kind of a marketing, uh, it, it's more than marketing, but it is also performing that function of this is who we are, look at our architecture. OK. I would say that the climate does play a part. Of Absolutely. It's an important part of it, too, but I think your point of there are other considerations beyond climate yeah. that give form it's to do with right. cultural expression, all sorts of things, including the longhouse as an expression of what the family was about, for yeah. instance. Yeah. So um, now we're going to pick up the thread that is the story of bamboo. Um, throughout the 80s and 90s, there was a Canadian jewelry designer who became uh, very successful. Uh, his name is John Hardy. Does anyone have John Hardy jewelry? Very expensive. Have you heard of John Hardy jewelry? Nordstrom's features it. New York Times advertisements. Anyway, um, someday I hope you all can afford it. Um, he made a fortune in the jewelry business, and in 2007 he sold his jewelry business uh, and his name uh, attached to the jewelry business and he suddenly had uh, money uh, and he made his jewelry in Bali he was raising his children in Bali he had always had a troubled relationship with schools and so he and his wife had to figure out how are we going to put our children into these horrible schools um, uh, and so they decided to uh, found an international school in Bali um, in 2007. So they called in the architects, and the architects did what we do. We showed them uh, a bunch of rectangular boxes with funny-shaped roofs, 
and you say, here's your school, you're welcome. And John Hardy and his wife Cynthia uh, basically uh, threw them out, said, um, this is the same penitentiary building that I went to school in. This is a completely different school than I went to, and it's got to be a completely different school building. And so uh, he built a school out of bamboo. And um, they didn't know uh, how to build out of bamboo, so they got a German guy, Jörg Stamm, to come and teach them. So they made the architect design this, or did he design this? He designed it. So he just was like, oh, thanks. Like, this is the kind of guy he is. Why hire a guy from Germany rather than someone from like, hmm. nearby? Uh, because no one would talk to him about bamboo, because bamboo is for peasants. Right? The Dutch, by this time, the Dutch um, campaign had worked its magic, and no one in their right mind would build anything but a pigsty out of bamboo. And even then, um, I had a student from Vietnam, and his uncle had uh, like a, a utility building in, you know, deep in the countryside of Vietnam, and the head of the village said, get rid of that. It's it's bringing down our property values. Get rid of that bamboo structure. If you need help, we'll send some people over to help you tear it down. But we want that bamboo structure gone. So bamboo is for, it's not even good enough for pigs. And so in that context, he had to hire um, people to come in from Colombia, from Germany, uh, who were experimenting with bamboo at the time. And they basically rewrote the book on bamboo uh, and what you can do with bamboo. And this is the first building they built, the largest bamboo structure in the world at the time, called the Heart of School. Uh, and since then, they've continued this process. They now have 64 buildings. Um, and there it is, the Heart of School. They have 64 buildings on this campus uh, built in this manner. And as you can see, there's no walls. There's no windows. Uh, there's no clay tile roof. Um, and there's John Hardy working with one of the architects. They start with sketches, then they go straight to model. Um, let's see if this will advance. And after they built the school, they decided to build uh, a village of uh, very expensive luxury homes out of bamboo because the, the international school was so successful. They had people coming from all over the world wanting to move to Bali so that their kids could go to the international school in Bali. So it became an attraction in itself. And so they built uh, a couple dozen of these buildings, uh, luxury bamboo <coughs> houses. Um, this is Pat Yoman. Uh, I introduced the idea when I visited them in 2012 that some of these workmen that they uh, have hired from the villages to work in bamboo, some of them are probably from families that had builder priests in them. And I even suggested to them that they won't necessarily tell you, but they themselves might be builder priests. Um, and they laughed at the idea, but then they started looking into it. And it turns out all the people building bamboo know about the traditional spiritual practices. Um, and I've been going back to the Green School. The, the name of the school is the Green School. The name of the luxury house complex is Green Village, if you want to look it up. I've been going back there every year with students and talking more and more with them. and. Um, you know, John Hardy came to Bali because it was a place where lots of hippies were going in the 70s. And he was an artisan, and a lot of people, a lot of artists were attracted to Bali because for very little money, you could have these incredible craftsmen build whatever you wanted to design. And that is still true um, today. A lot of designers go to Bali, design stuff, and have them built. Uh, and then exported for sale in Europe. And that's how he built his jewelry empire. Um, but he didn't go there because he was interested in Balinese culture. 
Uh, and so I have been introducing him um, to a lot of these ideas that maybe he, none of them until a year ago knew anything about the colonial project to eliminate bamboo. They just thought bamboo was cool. And I said, you know there's a history here. Um, and so it's been a very interesting process. Um, John's, John and Cynthia's children that they uh, built the school for are now older and now uh, uh, or at least two of them are older. Alora, his daughter, uh, has done her own TED Talk. John did a TED Talk, uh, and he won a prize, a TED Prize, for the international school. And then his daughter, has, she was a fashion designer, and she went to Parsons. Uh, she worked for Donna Karen. You've heard of Donna Karen, right? OK. Um, and then she went back to Bali, and she's the head designer for uh, these luxury houses. And uh, her brother, Oren, runs a permaculture farm. Um, and that's, we stay with Oren on his permaculture farm next to the Green School when I take students there every September. And um, so we've been having these conversations about the relationship between these Balinese craftsmen and the Balinese traditions. So here's the interior of one of the luxury houses under construction in 2012. Oh, this slide was supposed to be earlier. When they first started working with bamboo, they looked at the traditional buildings. So in a way, without ever knowing that McLean Pont had looked at all the traditional building uh, practices throughout Southeast Asia, they basically stumbled into the same thing. And so they studied all the vernacular buildings of the islands and started studying them by making models of them and picked up techniques for how these traditional buildings were built. And using those techniques, they started to extrapolate and do spiral buildings and round shapes and waving uh, roof forms. Uh, and they have several dozen, maybe a hundred models uh, like this, just to get to understand what bamboo has done throughout history in these practices. And what, there's a Minangkabao um, uh, house. Uh, and so you see lots of things that are very uh, funny. And they're all hanging on the roof, on the ceiling of, uh, the architecture office where they, um, and so here's this building under construction, uh, this luxury house in Green Village. And it's not just one of the luxury houses, it's a seven story, it's the most luxurious house ever uh, built. Um, and here's the Green Village and the, this big house, this big luxury seven story house is on the right. It's the largest roof form. <clears throat> and so they really are discovering new ways uh, to uh, use bamboo that goes way beyond the traditional uh, methods. Here's uh, a pop star who plays a bamboo electric guitar. <clears throat> um, we do a lot of stuff. So this is, this is my group of students. We start out by going to villages and get to understand the Hindu Balinese traditions. Um, we uh, do a quick workshop in model making with bamboo. And then we start going full scale. Uh, this woman was so proud of herself for making a successful fish mouth joint uh, with nothing more than a saw and a very sharp knife. Uh, here we are collecting trash from the countryside. And there we are uh, in the midst of building a coconut palm sugar refinery building um, that is basically an open pavilion to boil off the, um, the palm oil that gets collected to make palm sugar. Um, and there we are. There's a, the, the famous entry bridge to the Green School up to the left in the background and us um, cooling off after a hard day of construction in the pools along the river. 
here's so the slides are a little out of order this is green village um, there's the entry to that luxury mansion under construction and the same entry after it's completed we took this um, in September just a few weeks ago and they do really clever things with cutting uh, cross sections through bamboo poles bamboo and this is another way to connect to the eco uh, theme that you were working on last week the bamboo, uh, this bamboo, how old do you think this bamboo is? How long does it take to grow to this size so that it could be used as main structural elements for a building? 20 years. 5 years. 20. 20, 10, 5. 16. 1. Well, the closest answer is 1. Uh, if you don't harvest it, between the third and fourth year, it starts to lose its capacity uh, to be useful in a building. So these poles are no more than four years old. So bamboo is a grass, and it grows up to a meter a day when it's first sprouting. Uh, it grows in very wet soils, and it grows very quickly. It has a strength to weight ratio that makes it superior to steel because it's hollow and it puts all that, um, that good structural material far away from the neutral axis. You guys all studied structures. And so it's one of the, it's, it's as efficient as a, it's an efficient shape like a structural steel pipe, um, but it's more efficient than steel in terms of its strength to, to weight ratio. It does fail in cross grain uh, tension. So uh, you have to watch out for that. Um, that's its main failure mode, but um, you can do some amazing things with it. So this bamboo just like, I mean, I'm assuming it's like obviously easy, easily accessible for this area, but I mean, from what I understand, it's like expensive to get over here. Um, I just yeah. bought a shipment of bamboo for my students. Uh, we got about. 40 poles for $2,500, so yes, it's expensive. It grows in Mississippi, and it costs almost $1,000 to ship it up here. Oh, how, do you, how do you like preserve it so you don't have to keep replacing it, or is it naturally like preserved? So they soak it uh, in uh, boric acid um, for a week the same as Ponting Karsten. They used the technique that Ponting Karsten developed 100 years ago. And it, uh, it can last as long as any wood building. They, um, the form of the building is informed by the fact that it's good if you can have the roof overhang protect the base of the bamboo poles from getting wet in a rainstorm. So that's it's a big uh, uh, driver of these mushroom-shaped roof forms. Um, so my students are now today um, actually uh, working on the campus at Wentworth to, they started yesterday and I said, send me photos, but they just came, so I don't, I don't have them to show you. But um, they're trying to do a structure that looks something like this. That's John Hardy in the lower right, and that's um, one of the more recent structures that they built. So uh, for the last two years, we've been, uh, I've been taking students to Bali. We've been looking at what they're working on in terms of new techniques of bamboo construction. And then we bring that back to Boston, and we see if we can experiment and develop the ideas further. And then we went back this September, and we're continuing a lot of the experiments that they're um, operating with in Bali. And so they're, they're working with what we call splits. They're basically split sections of pole. Uh, but these students are keeping the splits connected to the poles. So there's a round pole base, then a pipe clamp to keep it from failing in cross grain tension. And then they take those splits and they weave them into a roof form. And that's what they're working on today. Um, they're the full-scale um, concrete footings upside down being cast. 
Uh, and that's a half-scale prototype um, in the courtyard. And yesterday, they moved every, uh, to full scale out on the campus on a grassy area along Huntington Avenue if you find yourself in Boston. So that's it. Thank you. Any other questions? It's sort of interesting that, you know, this is a very traditional material used for everyday, everyday structures. Mm -hmm. But it's also now become, it seems, a material for the very rich. It's become fashionable. It's like when Hassan Fathi and other people did mud houses. It was for the general pe peasant, if you like. Mm -hmm. Then somebody says, ah, this is indigenous. This is what real architecture belongs, the vernacular. And so all the very rich have built mud houses for mainly holiday houses, not necessarily their first house. So is that, do you think this is happening in other parts of Indonesia? Is Bali something special? Because we know that, uh, you know John Hardy, but there are other people also doing this stuff now. That's the question. Thank well, you. some of the workers who uh, were instrumental, and in, like Nyoman, the guy smiling, holding up the model, he's split off, and he's got his own firm now, and he's building luxury bamboo houses in bamboo, mm -hmm in parallel um, and uh, the the marketing arm of uh, Ibuku which is the design build company run by John Hardy's daughter Alora they're focusing on an international market so they've done um, some tourist based uh, they did a tourism school and some tourist facilities in Sumbawa in the eastern part of the archipelago they did the Tazo uh, chocolate factory right next door. But now increasingly, they just sent a team to someplace in Africa to build luxury resort bamboo structures. They're working on a house for Giselle, how do you say her name, Tom Brady's wife. Bunchen. How, how do you say it? Bunchen. Bunchen. So um, they, Alora was designing a house for her on an island in the Caribbean that they own. Um, but then they recently switched gears, and now they want to do a, a series of houses in Costa Rica at Playa Guiones. Um, so their market is increasingly international. Uh, and she keeps asking us, uh, how can we do bamboo in the U.S.? Um, and coincidentally, a graduate of Wentworth, he graduated three years ago. Uh, he graduated uh, the year after I visited Green Village for the first time, and I gave a lecture on bamboo, a very quick, it was a pacha kacha lecture, a six-minute lecture, where I showed a bunch of slides from Green Village. and. Um, just, and then he was my thesis student, and he was looking at very high theory stuff in New York Public Library, and that was his thesis. And the next thing I know, he's working for the only architecture design build firm in the United States that has ever gotten a bamboo building approved by the building department in Hawaii. And so I put him in touch with Alora to help coach them on how to get a building approved in the United States made out of bamboo. Um, and, but it's the same story that Wentworth uh, gave us when we um, tried to build a bamboo structure on campus last year. We asked for permission right at the beginning of the semester. They said, you got to talk to this guy. He's the one who you have to satisfy. Um, we talked to him. He was very supportive. He said, I'm going to clear the way. Don't worry about a thing. I'll take care of everything. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, checking in with them every few days. The uh, couple days before we were going to move onto campus and start building because we had another shipment of bamboo from Mississippi. Um, I go to his office and uh, I say, uh, where's David? And they say, oh, he's gone. 
So he was fired. And it wasn't like two weeks in, you know, no, he just, he was disappeared. Uh, and I said, well, uh, you know, we're, we're about to start building the bamboo thing. Um, it's okay, right? And they said, oh, you better talk to so-and-so. And so I went to talk to so-and-so and said, hey, David has been helping us, uh, so it's okay, right? I said, he said, oh, no, you have to get that approved. And I said, yeah, we, we got it approved, and he's been supporting us. And he said, no, you have to get it approved. It's going to take weeks. So he basically ignored all the... So we ended up um, building it on a farm south of... Basically, they said, uh, the, the lawyer for the university said, you can build. Just all we need from you is... Uh, a, a, a certified stamped drawings from a structural engineer guaranteeing that it's all all checks out. And I said, well, there are no engineering values. There's no book of engineering values uh, that's been produced for bamboo the way it has for wood, concrete, and steel. Um, so that and that's why we're doing this. We're we're a research function of the university, uh, and. This is our mission: is to figure out this, and so they said no, um, and so we couldn't build this year. They've softened up a bit, but um, it is impossible to legally build a bamboo structure in the United States, and I believe Alora and her company will never build a legal building in the United States. The process that uh, the firm in Hawaii has to go through is every pole that is used is sent to a testing company. They test each pole and stamp it on the structural capacity. And then they send it to a second firm to test it again. So each pole, before it's used in the building, is tested twice for its structural capacity. <coughs> then and only then can it be uh, placed in the structure of the building. So I think they'll never do it. Yeah. Um, is it easy to replace a pole? Or is it like coupon where you like pull one and all and pull one and pull one? It is easy to replace a pole. You pull one and the rest stay in place. It's a redundant structure. Yeah. And one of the things they do to test it is um, uh, I don't have the video loaded, but Basically, they build the model, and then they push on it, and they say, oh, it flexed. We have to reduce the spacing here and add another pole. And then they push on it again and say, oh, that's too much. And then, so they Goldilocks the model. Turns out that the structural behavior of the model scales more or less proportionally to the final structure. So they design it with a quick sketch. But then they really design it by building the model. Then they take the model, they strap the model to the back of a guy on a motorbike. He takes it to the building site. The poles are delivered. They use a stick to, it's a metric scale. They, they say, OK, here's the first pole. They, they measure the length of the pole in the model. Then they take a tape measure over to the pile of bamboo poles. And they pick one. And they put it in. And then they take the next measurement. They go to the bamboo pile, pick a pole, and they put it in. You can imagine, you've done drawings, right? You know, can you imagine what it'd be like to draw that and plan section elevation? Can you imagine what it'd be like, as hard as it is to draw it, I mean, I could draw that, right? But imagine you're on a job site and you're looking at a drawing of that and then build it. No way. It would be a disaster. The model skips the drawing part, basically. It is the construction document. That's the construction document. If you don't have the model on site, you can't build anything. And they mock things up at full scale with cardboard and pieces of bamboo, test it out, uh, like the furnishings, the built-in furnishings. Um, and uh, I had a video that didn't load for some reason that showed it was basically a tour of this luxury building <laughs> that um, really was a remarkable thing. 
Um, but in the States, I'm not you can find get it. bamboo floors. Yeah. But you have other, there are, and furniture, but that's been for right. a long time. It's not a because structural a engineer yeah, approved. That's why I knew that it was always kind of like luxurious in high school when we had to get samples for like the interior design class and like that one. Like even just looking online, even though the samples were free for the students, like mm -hmm. there was so much like, more than the rest of the wood that we were trying to order. Any other questions? But I think in, in Indonesia, I always assumed it was not as expensive as many other woods. Is that uh, true? Well, I just finished a house in Solo uh, where I designed it as a wood frame structure, as all houses are. And the builders said, no, you can't use wood. Wood costs a pound for pound something similar to what gold costs. You know, you just said, forget it. There's, you can't use wood. So we used aluminum uh, studs to frame the roof. Uh, and then it came time to build the, the veranda, the, uh, the pergola. And um, bamboo is basically free. I mean, it, it, it's yeah, not free, but it, it grows in three years. And people. That's the other thing. It's renewable very fast. That's one of the it, other reasons. It grows like weeds, and everyone grows it because it's useful for making uh, quick, like cremation towers that you burn down in Bali uh, for the cremation ceremony of. Uh, the Balinese, and um, so it's um, it's cheap and plentiful, and everyone knows how to <coughs> to use it. Why do they um, grow it in? Would you say Mississippi? Uh, they grow it in Mississippi. I think mainly for furniture manufacturers. Yeah, I think. Okay, I was like, that seems to be the most similar climate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a different species. There's over 1,500 species. Yeah. And because we have bamboo in this part of the world, right? Yeah, it grows in New England. Which it grows all over New England, too. It grows, it's like a weed. Once you plant it, you can't get rid of it. That's the other problem. <laughs> well, there are some species of bamboo that if you... Well, they can um, them, yeah. That if you plant it, um, you're actually... Uh, you could go to jail. Is that right? Because it's so destructive. Sounds like a better uh, clean my garden go back. So is this, this is just one species that's used here? Um, this is several species. You'll see black, you'll see black bamboo used uh, for its decorative quality in the floor. Um, the primary uh, structural pieces are um, uh, columus, I can't remember the full Latin name for it. Uh, but then the ones used for railings uh, are duri because they uh, are shaped, like the railings down there are made out of duri because of the quality of, um, of they bend a lot. And then uh, uh, the thinner poles where you want it to have curvature they use another species. So there's five or six species. Like the handrail is another species. Yeah. So when you preserve it, do you create the shape and like put it in the borax or do you still do it after it's dried out? You harvest it, um, you dry it out for a short period and then you soak it for a week in the borax, then you dry it out again. And they established, uh, this company established a, a whole facility for uh, processing uh, of growing, harvesting, processing, and preparing it for use in buildings. Do they shape it before they put it in light? It's mm -hmm. not like bent wood. You know? No. They, some, I guess the doorways, they craft the doorways in the factory, these uh, oval shaped doors. And some of the furniture they produce at their company. Yeah. yeah. I do, unfortunately. It dries out and basically explodes. It's one winter and it's gone. At least the, the mosso species we got from Mississippi, it's just um, destroyed.
Yeah, this is the seven-story, handcrafted, gorgeous sculptural house. There's no walls. There's no walls, except in a few places. If we if we go downstairs from here, uh, there are, are pivoting glass panels that can close off the bedroom, and you can air condition the bedroom because it gets around 90. It's humid and gets up to the mid 90s. Although the last few years, I showed up there completely unprepared in terms of the clothing I brought because it was a good 10 degrees cooler than it's ever been. So climate change, and then it was raining during the dry season. Um, so I didn't have a raincoat and I needed a sweater at night. And that's both unheard of in September in Bali. So here's some walls. You know, there are bathrooms in there uh, and air conditioned spaces. So I think we're heading into a, a bedroom now. So that door was produced in the factory. Uh, it has this translucent rice paper. Um, here's the bathroom. Maybe that's the end. Mosquito netting on the beds. Mosquito netting to yeah on the Just beds. The yeah. So the major reason why there's not the bamboo buildings in the United States isn't because of the cost. It's because of just the structure and like the process that would have to go through. We don't know about from here. Yes. Just because if it's I mean if it's as abundant as abundant as it is here, if it just grows like weeds, I would assume that if you would attack at least even in Hawaii or something. There is no legal basis for building with bamboo, yeah. and that prevents it from <laughs> happening even if people would want to build with bamboo. Whereas in Indonesia and throughout Southeast Asia, the image problem of the bamboo is keeping it from being used. Uh, even though it's the cheapest thing to build anything out of and it's legal to build, like in Vietnam, for example, um, no self-respecting person would ever build I would live in anything made out of bamboo. Did you um, hide all the twine in the bamboo itself, or like, is the rice actually running? The short answer is yes. The plumbing is hidden, and the wires are hidden in the bamboo. It's very well done. But it really is the most beautiful house I have ever seen. I can hook you sure. up. I have a bunch of some quite nice images I took of this house. Of John Harris. Yeah. Oh, so you met him? Yeah. He's such a character. He's a yeah, He was nominated for the award. Yes. Never got it. He and he's better pissed off. He's from. bitter about that. Yeah. Did he share that with you? He did. He mentioned it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've met him before. Yeah. He has some choice words for the Aga Khan Award. Yeah. He deserved to be looked at seriously. I think so too. But that's the advantage of building in this place. You don't need windows and walls except for the air conditioning, which you do. Whether it's hotels or whether it's this time. Yep, okay. When's the last time you put together a trip to anywhere in Australia? For students. For students. When I was at MIT, I thought it was I would, I've been, I wanted to do some, but uh, it is always expensive. How do you manage to do this in terms of... Well, the students pay for it. Yeah. They, um, we tell them uh, a year ahead of time. Actually, we tell students when they're applying to the graduate program, oh, by the way, you should, uh, when you're going for your student loans, you should include not just tuition, room and board, all this, you should include $3,000 to pay for your 10-day trip to Bali. And, um, and they say, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. 
there, there, even if you can't convince Hassan to take you here. Uh, oh, I'd be convinced. I'm, I'm convinced. <laughs> easy. I'd be happy to go into it. There is a program. There is a program called Bamboo U that is open. You could register and go. It's a two week program uh, doing exactly what we did and taking a tour of this house. Um, so check the website. I think the next one is in November. <laughs> that's, that's, uh, that's soon. <laughs> you better get on it. There are a bunch of wonderful places to go to for looking at architecture and ways people go. Bali is certainly one of them, I would say. Bali is still a wonderful place to go to. Pardon? Stop.